So I took this doubling every year and extrapolated it 10 years from 1965 to 1975 from 60 components to 60,000 components on a chip. The first thing you have to tell him is, yeah. guys, we've been giving you a free ride for 30 years <laughs> while you write your crummy software and we made it faster. Right? That's, that's over. The future is parallel. Single cores are not getting any faster. Good afternoon. Uh, so if you were in my CSE 141 lecture, uh, nice to see you again. So uh, this is going to be, so this is our first lecture on CSE 141 L. L stands for lab. So what's what are we going to do in a lab uh, comparing against uh, the CSE 141 lecture? So as I said previously in the CSE 141, we focus a lot on um, writing a good software, how to make your code more efficient, and uh, how to be a good programmer. However, um, by good, pro good, good programmer here, I mean like a programmer who can write very fast code, not the programmer who can write code very fast. So, uh, but what about CSE 141? So as I mentioned, we put most of the software stuff on the lecture side, on the class side, but for the lab side, we are really going to uh, deal with the hardware. So uh, for 141L, you will be building your own processor. So uh, then, and what I, so, so today I'm going to talk about how are we going to approach the goal of building your own processor. So in this class, well, there's nothing else we will be doing. You will be designing and, in, uh, be designing and implementing a microprocessor that's on, your, that's on your own. So the goal is that uh, we want to practice what you learned you will learn in CSE 141 and uh, extend what you will learn in CSE 141. So in CSE 141, we did discuss, well, there are processors and here is the architecture of the processor. The processor should support these instructions or whatever. However, in CSE 141, we didn't spend, we are not going to spend a lot of time to talk, uh, talk about like how this hardware is designed or what, uh, how this hardware is designed in detail at least. Right, so um, with CSE 141, right, uh, L, you will be able to understand how deeply, uh, very deeply about how this processor would work. And for CSE 141, all you need to know is that we have this processor and this is the function of the processor. But in CSE 141 L, it's going to be, how can I achieve these functions with the, uh, in hardware? And uh, we will see like, how can you uh, make your own architecture in a real design. And well, in the past, I will say like, this is not uh, that contributive to a CS student, but right now uh, is, as you might be aware, like companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, they are building their own chip. They are building their own hardware. So even though you think you are a computer scientist, but maybe in the future, you will spend a lot of time writing very low code for a specific applications. So uh, it's also a good uh, experience for you to work on a very large scale project because uh, this is going to be a big project. And that's why later on you will learn, we will uh, give you guys uh, chances to work in a group. So, uh, and most important thing, this is summer and this is San Diego, so have fun. Well, although I don't think uh, during the social distancing period of time, we can have too much fun, but uh, uh, I, I know you will have a lot of interesting story that you can share with your friends later on uh, after after you, you you took this class, so this is going to be a very fun experience that you will have. 
So here's the course content. So in this class, you are going to implement a pipeline MIPS processor, which is exactly the same one that, uh, or say a trimmed down version or a simplified version of the MIPS processor uh, that is described uh, on the textbook within five weeks. And it will be able to run simple but real programs that are compiled using GCC. And it will be able to run uh, to do some simple I.O. So you will see like it's printing something on the model same screen. And uh, it, you can further customize the processor that uh, uh, to make it your own. And in fact, we are going to give you some code bases to start with your own processor. And you have to design the rest and um, you, we will give you spec about like, okay, what are the functions that you need to achieve for this processor? But we don't care how you would um, design this function. So it's like a software in some sense that we just give you a spec, we give you the code base, but how are you going to extend the code base? Um, that will be completely up, uh, up, up to you and, and your group members. So this is actually going to be what's going on in the class uh, for the lab. And we will have five labs and those five labs, it will be doing, uh, it will be due on every Friday starting from this Friday. And uh, we have Zoom lectures. It's going to be uh, the same Zoom link on uh, a 2 CSE 141's lecture so that you guys don't have to keep so many links and you don't have to uh, worry about like you mess around. Uh, it's, only, it's going to be the same lec uh, lecture Zoom video and all the office hours will share the same uh, link as well. And this class, uh, 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 for, for Zoom lectures, we will also uh, we will, uh, please check the schedule because we are not going, although the, the system is saying that we are going to meet on every Monday, Wednesday, but this is the only Monday lecture. This is the only Monday lecture on for CSE 141L for this summer session too. The, uh, we will do the lectures on Wednesdays, but not on Mondays later on. And during the lecture, because we only have five labs, so we only need five lectures. and um, uh, during, during this lecture, we will talk about like uh, some very low coding. We will talk about what are the spec, what are the requirements we have for the processor. And we will discuss the, your issues with the current lab and the upcoming labs. So it's more about like, uh, we, I, will, I will briefly go through an, an overview of each lab project. And uh, later on, if you have, uh, and then you can ask questions uh, and if nobody has questions, we will finish the lecture. So that's pretty much like a group office hour or discussion session instead of a regular lecture. Because from my perspective for the last thing, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to have an hour long, hour, hour long lecture. It makes more sense that I give you guys more time uh, to practice. And so um, instead of doing, uh, doing, doing a lot of lectures, uh, what I will be doing is that I will host as many office hours as possible. And you will see like how, how many office hours we have later on. And uh, the, the, the lectures will be on YouTube. And unlike CSE 141, uh, our CSE 141 lectures are not going to be that interactive and we don't count participation. So if you don't have any specific question that you want to discuss, uh, you don't have to uh, really log into Zoom to watch the CSE 141L lecture. You can watch it on YouTube. And there's no final exam. So some, some of you were saying about like, oh, there is a conflicting uh, time schedule of the final exam on CSE 141. And that's actually not an issue at all because CSE 141L doesn't actually have a final exam. So that's the course format. So first of all, I want to give you a warning. The course has a lot of work when, and there's a lot of work, they are actually not difficult. They are just time consuming. So uh, I, I really want you to spend, uh, to, to take this experience, to uh, practice your skill in uh, time management. So make sure, and again, this is 141L class only has two credits. So don't let this two credits for you. And it's more important, uh, if you care about GPA, then 141 is definitely more important than 141L. However, if you just because if, if, if you try to let 141L take over your time so that you do a terrible job on both of them, that's not a good idea. So make sure that you have good time management. And 
how do you make sure that you always have good time management and don't let these two units fool you? Is that don't fall behind. The left build on each other and it's hard to catch if you fall behind. And don't wait until the last minute because uh, this hardware is not, well, I want to, I, I want to criticize about the very log a little bit. And some of you already took uh, CS140, you know how difficult or how terrible the tool chain of very log uh, like Otero tools are, right? They are complicated, they are buggy and your code will, you will be buggy and there is no good debuggers like what you have on the software. So, uh, so it's, it's going to be a lot of work and a lot of work within that, it turns out that uh, it's not because it's hard. It's just because, uh, well, it's hard in a way that it's just a lot of details that you have to sort out. So it's not uh, difficult to understand. It's actually uh, time consuming to make it right. So that's, that's the first warning I want to give you. So first of all, make sure that you are always on schedule. So, uh, um, so the first lab, we are going to let you familiar with the tools. You will have two tutorials. Uh, you can find it online uh, through our website. And the website uh, will, will have a comprehensive uh, explanation how to use uh, quotas, how to use model sim. And for those of you who already have experience in CSE 140, you probably already know that. And I would suggest you to start now. And for the lab one, it's pretty straightforward, step by step, follow the exactly what the web page is telling you and uh, you should be able to get the uh, document ready by Friday. And as I said, uh, for lab one, and lab one is going to be the only project that we have to have you all doing this in uh, individually. So, um, so, but starting from lab two, starting from lab two, it will be in group projects. So for the lab two, uh, it's implementing uh, a data pass element that's required, uh, that are required for a subset of NIFS instructions. And you are not going to start from scratch. We will give you the design and some other key components. So you, you will implement design by your, but you just need to assemble them together and try to extend them together. And it's going to do next Friday, two weeks from now. And we will have a lecture on lab two this Wednesday. And for lab three, um, we will add control path to lab two. So it's built on top of lab two. So you, you see that, right? If you have your lab two fallen behind, then there's no way, uh, it's hard to catch up on lab three. And test your simple processor and it will execute simple program. So that's going to do uh, uh, about like two and a half weeks from now. And uh, for lab four, uh, we are going to add more features to support more MIPS instructions. And uh, it's going to have, uh, you are going to have a processor. Um, um, uh, it's, it's going to have a processor that's uh, working on more instructions and it's going to do uh, uh, like by the end of August. And uh, the first week of September, uh, you will have a full fledged pipeline processor and we will measure the performance. And um, um, in the past, if we can meet in person, what I will do is that I will, um, I will order some pizza and we will have price for everyone uh, for, 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 for some of the processor with exceptional performance. But here's the deal that I will give you. So uh, I will still send out uh, gift cards to the top performance uh, group and uh, all you need to do like, okay, is to report your performance and then I will, well, uh, during your demo and then I will, I will, I will, I will send out those e-gift cards uh, through Amazon from you. So hopefully that will give you some incentive to make your performance better. And if you really want a better grade, so if you have done with lab five, if you have done with lab five, you already get an A. So this class, no test, no quiz, no reading. And all you need to do is that before September 4th, give me a lab five. That's a pipeline processor and go through, uh, go through all the labs before September 4th. And uh, if everything works correctly, everything functions right, you get an A. But I know some of you are not satisfied with 
um, A. If you want an A plus, well, before September 4th, you can implement any fancy features that you learned in CSE 141. So for example, in CSE 141, we're going to talk about cache. We are going to talk about multi -core processor. We are going to talk about branch prediction. We are going to talk about speculation. We are going to talk about dynamic scheduling. If any of the features showing up in your pipeline processor, you will get an A plus. That's lab six. Okay. So uh, for the lab this time, uh, we don't have the physical lab for you guys to access. However, uh, the, the, the IT support already set up cloud labs for us. And uh, because I never have a cloud lab experience in the past, but suppose it's going to be cloudlabs.ucsd.edu and you can log in, select our class, and you should be able to find those Altera tools already installed in their images. And uh, uh, including model sim and Altera uh, quotas too. So those are available for you. And even though uh, you don't want to use Cloud Lab because sometimes the latency is really long. So, um, um, so, 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 so uh, in this case, uh, you probably want to install those tools on the virtual machine, which like I did. So that's also possible. And how to install and what versions you want, you can find it online through our webpage. So, uh, how to do the work. So for lab one, uh, should be done individually. And for lab two to five, we suggest you can you guys can work in group of two. And, but we know sometimes you really, you, some of you guys are really inseparable. Uh, so let's say up to three. However, more than three is not acceptable. And um, uh, there's are some guidelines. You cannot merge groups, and but uh, you can split up. And, for lab two to five, you don't have to write a report. However, you have to schedule an interview on Zoom during our office hours before uh, every Friday, 5 p.m. That's our deadline. And uh, we will we want to interview with the whole group so we, we can make sure uh, and we will rent, we will we, we will ask questions uh, randomly. So we make sure that everyone in a group is doing some work and there is no written report necessary. Okay. So regarding the grading, so here is the table of grading. If you have done lab one, you submit lab one, you get a D. If you, you, have, you have some like zombie for lab two, you get a C minus. If you have a working lab two, you get a C. If you have uh, a, 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 like uh, almost like a dying lab three, you got a C plus. If you have a working function, fully function, uh, lab three, you got B minus. If we see like you are trying to do some work for lab four, you got B. If you are done with lab four, you got B plus. If you are, uh, if you are done with lab five, well, if you are halfway to lab five, you got an A minus. If you are done with lab five, you got an A. And the hidden level will be like a legendary uh, Pokemon, right? So for the hidden level, you will definitely get an A plus, right? So that's the story. So. Um, all right, I see a few questions from you guys. And if you have questions, I do like you guys to raise your hands because uh, it's a little bit, uh, 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 it's a little bit hard for me to see what's going on on Zoom. So first of all, uh, some of you were commenting about like, uh, 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 okay, so I have Nick first. Okay, Nick, what's your question? Um, for the lab six, what if mm -hmm. you don't have an A? Could it count for- well, it's not possible. Okay. Yeah, because for lab six, lab six is building on top of lab five. So it's not possible that uh, you have a not working lab five, but still working lab six. I see, okay. Okay, so Alan, question? Uh, so you get two grades. It's possible to only get two different grades for each lab. What do you mean? Like I'm looking at like, oh, like for so lab one, it's F or D. So, so for the gray part, right? So for F of D or, or D, right? So if you, if you, if you, if you didn't, okay. So when I say like, uh, if you, when I say lab two, it's a function, it's a functioning lab two. Yeah. Right. And for lab one, if you hundred percent following our document, there's no reason why you should get an F. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So let's say I get a D, uh, let's say I do 100% on lab one and then lab two, 
my project is bad, I'll just get a C minus if it doesn't work properly. Yeah. But how do you determine what is like bad? Like, what if you just turn in like well, two so, lines so, of code? Okay, so we will we for, for each design, right? It's like software testing, right? You will you will you will have a software that has to pass all the test cases for your hardware. We will also prepare those test test cases, right? And if you cannot pass those test cases, it's going to be like an incomplete lab, and that one would would, would put you in. Uh, the situation of C minus for lab two, for example. Okay, so it's like a threshold you have to get past to get the upper. No, level. you have to pass everything. Oh, everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay, Harris. So, I'm I'm guessing the main reason this uh, the final grade is based on this very cumulative manner is because like lab one in order to do lab one it is dependent that you manage to 100 percent uh lab one and then in order to do lab three it is dependent that you 100 percented lab two like you got that down and then right you lab right. and so it doesn't really make sense like if you partially did like you know if you did lab one and lab two correct but you didn't really do lab three that well like you're missing some cases right then you can it's not possible to go on to lab four or right. get a higher so grade because it lab four depends on lab three being done a hundred percent correctly. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. So let me see what other questions you guys have. Well, is it necessary to have a group of two or three? No, that's not. You can also work individually. And in fact, one of our tutors, she works uh, individually in the past when she took my class and, uh, um, uh, uh, what else? Um, uh, so some some of you were questioning about like why this class is only two two credits, but that's not my decision, so I cannot do anything with it. And how about pass non pass? Oh, well, I mean, uh, I don't know how they how they how they define passing grade. I would expect anything uh, above C minus is considering as a passing. So. Uh, that's how they probably would grade it. And um, um, do we have discuss on uh, Tuesday for 141? I think some of you, uh, there is no discussion session this Tuesday because we don't, I don't think we have sufficient amount of stuff for you guys to discuss. Plus the discussion session is mainly on homework and uh, the homework was, is not going to be assigned yet on Tuesday, but it will be assigned on Wednesday. So uh, Thursday uh, discussion session. And uh, you just check the calendar. And if the calendar uh, doesn't have that thing, it's not scheduled. Okay, so um, yeah. So are we going to have reporting on the first week? Yes, for the first week, that's the only week you will have a return report. Other than that, it's all on based on interviews, all right? So instructor, that's me, and the lectures, uh, lab hours, and uh, it's just code, just check our web website or the calendar. It has it has the the schedule, right? And uh, um, we have two tutors, uh, Boren Wan and Andrew Nguyen. And for Boren, she took my class in the past, and uh, she's she's willing to host lab hours uh, on Zoom through our office hour links. Uh, it's every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, 7 p.m. to 9.20 p.m. And for Andrew, he would like to host his lab hours on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Plus, I'm going to have lab hours on Monday and uh, Friday. The time is going to be on calendar. You will see it on uh, website as well. So you can see we have, we have seven days in a week are all covered. So don't, don't tell me that you cannot find a time to meet with any of us because I feel it's almost impossible. We are covering seven days in a week. So we are providing you very good support in tutor uh, hours or office hours. And I turn uh, my lecture time into, uh, in, in addition to that, I also add a few hours as office hours. So I'm hosting like a total, like five to six hours in helping you guys, right? So it's better than, um, it's better than having uh, those lectures because I think for lab class, it's more important that you do it rather than uh, listen to it. So 
Um, so, uh, so some of you were asking about like what happened if you miss one lab deadline and then do two labs together over next week. Okay, possible, no penalty. But as I said, catching up itself is already a penalty. So that's why I, it's always you are always welcome to submit a lab later if you cannot submit the lab on time. But the due date is more like a checkpoint, and we hope you do this on schedule. However, if you are late on submission, uh, you can still submit later. There's no penalty. But as I said, because uh, it's better that you do stuff on schedule because if you are late, it's hard to catch up. So I, I will say like being late itself is already some kind of penalty. So course resources. Uh, so we have the course web page. Uh, uh, it's just different from the, uh, the, 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 the lecture. Uh, the, the lecture, lecture part of CSE 141 by one letter. So make sure that you add this L uh, to find the right page. We have a separate canvas uh, as uh, CSE 141. So it's also different. And we share the same discussion board because in the past I have a separate board for uh, CSE 141 and uh, 141L, but it turns out that nobody is asking question on uh, CSE 141, but everyone is asking questions on CSE 141 now. So we this time I decided to set up a combined uh, Piazza to reduce the number of links you have to memorize because this time plus the Zoom plus the YouTube plus the website plus the campus. I I know you have tons of links that you you want uh, you you will have to track down. So I'm I'm doing this just because I want to reduce your burden. All right. So right now Q and A. So questions about uh, the lab or the structure uh, for the lecture or anything. If you have questions, raise your hand. Other questions? Okay, so I have uh, Byron. Yeah, um, about how many hours do you expect us to put in per lab? Ah, good question. I would say it depends. Well, so so sometimes like some people they can like one of my talented students i think he can spend like less than five hours per week and finish a lab and he did like even uh, the whole lab just by himself but some people i do see they even slept uh like uh in the lab overnight so i would say it completely depends okay thank you other questions? All right, so uh, how many of you have learned Verilog before? If you, uh, if you have learned Verilog before, use the little green uh, check uh, uh, in Zoom so that I know if I need to continue. Okay, I see 17, 18. Okay, so uh, 17, 18, 19. Okay, so if you have learned very long before, you are free to leave now because uh, the rest of the lecture slides is going to be about very long. So uh, if you already learned very long and you're really good at very long, it's just a waste of time to listen to the rest of the lecture. And it's probably uh, a better use of your time to start the lab right now. And if you are not familiar with the very log or you think uh, you need to spend time uh, reading, uh, uh, like review what very log is, uh, that's what the rest of the lecture is about. So, um, so for very log, it's a hardware description language. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit, it's very, uh, it, it uses a, a C or Java like syntax. However, uh, you will figure out that uh, there are a lot of difference in their in their in their spirit in their models. So, uh, but first of all, let's look at how Verilog will work. So, that, so like a, a programming language is a modern program that you have a compiler and the compiler will generate machine code. And Verilog is like that. It's a hardware description language, and we do have something called compile similar to compiler. It's called synthesizer. It will transform the hardware description language. Uh, description language into physical implementation like transistors, gates, and um, so so that's that's co synthesis. Uh, that's co synthesis, and uh, uh, it's it's similar to the concept as compiler. 
So in this way, like, because we have the programming language, because we have the compiler, so you don't have to write programs in assembly language. And the same thing with Verilog, right now you don't have to design hardware in gates, in transistor. So that's Verilog. And um, Verilog uh, has only one data type called big vector. So unlike uh, C programming language, they have a lot of different data types like in, in integer floating point. No, there's nothing like that. In Verilog, everything is bit or big vector. So a bit could be zero or one, which you should uh, already be very familiar with. However, uh, if you learn CSE 140, there are some unknown value or say don't care values like in sometimes in circuit design, we just don't care about these values, then uh, you can put an X in representing the context of it. And uh, there are also like floating, floating gates that you can use Z to re represent that. So basically, although it's a big factor, but uh, the value within a bit could be um, any of the four, but outside of that is not valid. So uh, you can express the big vector in multiple ways. So saying that I have a four bit binary, you put a four here and uh, you put a prime B saying that this is, a, this is a binary and you can put like one, 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 zero. And, uh, but sometimes if you just have a, a sequence of one zeros, it's too hard to distinguish. So they have some kind of human readable representation that you can put this underscore anywhere you like in a number just for readability, but the compiler would, um, would ignore it. And for 16-bit hex decimal, uh, 16 and um, prime, and then say like H, so it means hex. So like this one, we will treat 0, 3, 4, F in hex, and that's your number. You can also use decimal, and uh, you, can, uh, you can say it's a decimal, and this, num this big vector has 32 bit. We will map 270 into the big vector that's corresponding to uh, this decimal value. So that's how you uh, describe values of big, vac big vector vectors in uh, very long. And Verilog also support a set of, of uh, arithmetic logic bitwise operator relational operators. So for arithmetic operators, we have the plus subtraction, we have the multiplication. And um, these three you can use. For division, mod, power, well, Verilog does have it. However, if you try to use that one according to our experience, you are circuit will not synthesize and or will not be able to put into the design that we have. So never use this three, even though uh, a lot of slides tells you that well, Verilog support them, but don't use them. And there are logical, uh, like not and or, it's, it's logical. So you can, you can compare them to see if it's, uh, uh, it's compared for condition. And there are bitwise operators, like if you want to do not, it's actually saying that like if you do not zero, it's going to give you a one bit by bit. So that's a, but if it's logical, uh, it's a little bit different that if you put a not there, it's going to be giving you anything. It's, it's going to tell you that everything that is not zero is going to be true, right? So that's, that's the difference between logical and bitwise not. And uh, same thing for an and, or, and in addition, they also support like exclusive or exclusive nor shift left, shift right. Relational operators like uh, greater than, less than, greater and equal, those are supported. And other things that you may want, like concatenation, saying that I have two big vectors, can I concatenate together as a different number? That's possible. So you will be using this concatenation and plus uh, a comma to combine two numbers together. And replication, saying that I'm too lazy to write a lot of uh, zeros, you can just do replication like this, saying that I have four times uh, bit uh, zeros and uh, it's going to give you that. And uh, some of you are from, who are familiar with C, you know uh, you can do if else like this and it's also uh, acceptable in Verilog. So that's a basic syntax of Verilog. And in Verilog, there are two things to describe the connection uh, or say the input or output of your mod module. 
So one is called wired. Wired is to de denote a hardware net. And uh, it's something like a physical copper wire that you will uh, propagate your number. So it doesn't have storage because as long as you put something on wire, it will go through and immediately banish or whenever the new value comes in. So it doesn't have any kind of memory. And the other type of uh, IO is called REC. So REC here doesn't necessarily mean register. It's only some kind of hardware or, well, it's, it could be a wire, depending on what a compiler or say synthesizer is thinking about. And it could actually be implemented in register, but it's only used, it's only, it's used for procedural assignment. So you can consider them as some kind of local variable that allow you to pass this value uh, around different modules. And uh, the compiler or say the synthesizer would de 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 uh, decide what kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, uh, what, what way we are going to deal with that uh, data storage for that value. So that's the difference between wire and reg. And um, um, they are slightly different. And uh, depending on what your module requires, some of the module they require wires, some of the module require regs. Okay, Harris, question? Yeah, so when it comes to recs, are we still using that or are we using um, logic for that? Uh, say again. Uh, the keyword logic, it, for newer versions of Verilog, it has been used to replace reg, mm -hmm. R-E-G. Um, so are we so using for, a So that's of, why we, we use this version of the Altera tools. Okay. All right. So that's why we want everybody to work on the same version so that there's no confusion. Okay, uh, Tui, questions? Yeah, sorry. I wanted to quickly go back because um, I was confused. Like, what did you say was the difference between um, the logical and the bitwise operators that are okay. the same? So, sorry. So saying this, right? So saying that uh, I have a value like one, one, right? Yeah. And if I say not one, one, right? It's going to be zero. Mm-hmm. Because anything that is not zero is considered as, it's like true and false, false, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So everything that is not zero is considered, uh, well, it's only see zero and non-zero. And everything that is zero, uh, non-zero will consider as the same. That's logical, right? But for bitwise, if I do a not, well, so that's not a good, a good example. Let's say I have one zero, right? I have a one zero. And not one zero would give you zero. Right, but mm -hmm. if I have a not one zero, it's actually going to flip every bit, so you are going to get zero one. Oh, okay, okay, I get it now. For okay, thank you so much. No problem. All right. Uh, okay, so that's the variable thing uh, in Verilog. It's called. Uh, it's called. Uh, it's, we are not using any other variable than just rec. Okay, so these are just the basic basic of. Um, um, so this is this uh, these are the basic of Verilog, and um, so let's start from a design. So saying that uh, in CSD 140, you must learn about this. And uh, if you have no idea about what this is, uh, I doubt why you are here because you are supposed to have CSD 140 as the prereq, right? And if you forget about what is this, make sure that you know what is this. But let's accept this. If I want to make a four bit adder. You need three full adders and one half adder. So that's the ba very basic carry repo adder. And, um, and uh, in, 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 in our hardware design, because we are having uh, four adders, uh, we can make a four adder, each of the, we can make four adder itself like a module. So it's like, so it's like software, right? Uh, in software, we call this four adder module as a function. Right, but right now in hardware we just name, name it as a module. So a four-bit adder is actually calling four adder function three times and the half adder function three uh, one time. So it's the same thing. Your adder should have three four adder modules and one half adder module, and uh, it will receive inputs as recs and uh, it will output its uh, carry to another function module as the input. So that's a basic idea of four-bit adder. 
right? And uh, some of the output, they will directly go to our results. So that's the four bit adder. So, um, so here's the module of the half adder. So if you learn CSE 140, you probably know this is the truth table of, uh, uh, of a half adder and how this uh, become uh, the, this two lines. And from this four adder, you know that, well, this, uh, this uh, for this four half adder, you know, like the out is like uh, a prime B uh, um, or a B prime. So uh, when you assign out, you can do like a prime B uh, and or a B prime, right? So it's exactly the same as your Boolean uh, functions that you can derive from the truth table. And if you know, if you don't know how to derive this, that's probably uh, you probably have to review your material in CSE 140 a little bit. And for the C out, uh, it's going to be A and B. So we, we just put A and B here, the bitwise uh, operator. So that's the whole module. And you need two input, uh, two inputs, the A and B, and you want C out and out, right? So that's pretty trivial, right? For the half adder, right? So, uh, so this input, they are called input ports and this output, they are called output ports. And for a full adder, uh, here is the truth table converted functions like that. And again, uh, in addition, what's the difference between full adder and the half adder is that the full adder would have an additional input called C in, right? And because of the C in, so the truth table looks like this, the function looks like this. So if I want to build an adder, we, we have, we need three full adders like this and one half adder like this. And the half adder, would put its C out as another input as an input uh, of another adder. So this uh, another, the full adder would change this like this. So that's why it's called carry repo adders, right? But for the rest of the stuff like uh, like the uh, the 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 uh, the the all, uh, for other outputs, you should directly have them go through uh, the user outputs. So that's what uh, a full adder looks like. Right, so it's basically like calling the module three times, uh, full adder module three times, and use a half adder. Right, so it's very sim simple, uh, similar to uh, software design in some sense. Right, so uh, and if you write your module in this way, and another thing, there are several different ways of declaring a module, but I do uh, want you guys to use the way that I'm doing here because it will make your code less buggy in a way that. Um, you see that? Because here we are binding um, the input A. Uh, um, uh, so, so in this way, you are binding uh, A0 to input A. You are binding B0 to input B, right? Instead of just putting it in, in the order. So uh, you, have the, you have the binding that your compiler will catch up. So even though you mess up with your order, uh, you will still get the design correctly, right? But if you don't do this, it's hard to make it right. So that's my suggestion that you should use this kind of uh, is you, you should use this kind of assignment uh, to your function or say your module, right? And I didn't list the other one because I really don't like you guys to use the other one because it's going to be more uh, error prone, right? So um, okay, um, so in 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 the module that we are going to give you and in the test bench you are going to write there is going def there's there, definitely we are going to see always block. And the always block uh, uh, is, is actually help you to build a combinational logic. And uh, uh, so, so the basic idea of this combinational logic is that, well, whenever, whenever you see any of the input is changed, the following will be is queued. So that's the, that's, that's the meaning of the always block. So the always would tell you like, okay, if any of the input changes, the following, uh, operation will be done, right? So that's exactly what the combinational logic is about. And, um, but there's also another way that you can use always block and that will create sequential logic. So saying that uh, I want to create sequential logic and uh, if you have learned CSE 140, you, you know what really controls sequential logic is the clock. So you want your always block to work on a positive age or on negative age, right? And whenever you detect the positive age of a clock, you will do uh, what's, what's in between, right? So that's, uh, that's, 
that's 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 uh that's how you use always block for either combination of logic or uh, sequential logic. And another thing, another thing, which is a very very important and also very very confusing concept in Verilog is this: the non-blocking assignment and the blocking assignment. So, if you are putting your code in an always block and you put an equal sign here, it will give you a blocking assignment. But if you put smaller than equal, it's going to be a non-blocking assignment. So what's the difference between blocking and non-blocking assignment? So for blocking assignment, it means that the, 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 this, the, the, the blocking line must be finished before you can uh, is kill the next assignment. For non-blocking, it means all the assignments, they would happen at the end of the block, all at the same time, all at the same time. And there are some rules here. For the left-hand side, if it's within an always block, it must be a wreck. And for the right-hand side, it could be a wire, a reg, a constant, or an expression or whatever. And um, however, the left-hand side, it must be a reg. Okay, so let's see. What's the difference between the blocking and non-blocking assignment? We said for non-blocking assignment, so this is non-blocking assignment, everything happens at the end. So initially I have A equal to two, B equal to three. But because everything happens simultaneously at the end. So I would take the initial value of B here, three, the initial value of A here. So what I end up with is that after this assignment, um, A will be three, C will be two. However, if you have a blocking assignment, the next assignment can only get through after this assignment is done. So if you have the B initially at three, the A must become three before we can, pro we can proceed. So when you go to C equal to A, the C will be three as well. So both of them will be three, uh, be three if you use blocking assignment. So that's the difference between blocking and non-blocking call. So always block would help you uh, and always block uh, have some other, uh, I would say like uh, help you to make your code more like uh, a C code in some sense that we do support if else a uh, statement like this, but you can also use case, right? So this would make your hardware design uh, easier to track. And uh, if you use uh, case, then it's easier for you to see what's going on there. So both are acceptable in always block. All right, so uh, in your benchmark code of the hardware design, you will definitely see a lot of initial, uh, you will definitely have to have an initial block, which is killed only once in the beginning of the code and it's going to set up the initialization status conditions for your code. So uh, if you want to test the adder, right? You probably need, uh, you, you will write a module called test bench and you will set a time scale like one nanosecond slash one nanoseconds. It tells you that uh, your, your, your time scale is going to be one nanosecond. It means that uh, here, the number we are putting here is like a nanosecond, right? So if you have 50 nanosecond uh, as a, and if you control, if, you, if this 50 nanosecond changes every clock, then 50 uh, times two, which is like uh, um, the, Okay, some of you asked about like what an always, um, always start means. It means that anything, anything, anything changes, you will, you will go into uh, the always block. And uh, okay, so for testing the adder, um, it, so this 50 means that, well, I will do this uh, at the 50 nanosecond. After 50, I will do this, right? So if with this initial block, at the first 50 nanosecond, you can assign, you will assign your A at three, B as four. And then uh, 50 minutes, uh, 50 nanoseconds later, 
uh, your, your A value will become this and B value will become this. And then you will test your module like that. So this is how, how, you, how you would use initial block for testing your, uh, your code. All right. So this is probably the basics that you need for uh, Verilog. And finally, regarding some of the coding suggestion, because like the adder, well, here we said it's about like four bit. But what if I want to make the adder larger? Then you can probably uh, make parameterize it. So for example, you can put parameter like width equal to 32. And then uh, the next time you use the adder, you can optionally say that I want an adder uh, with like four bit, then it will become a four bit adder. But if you don't do this, you have to write your own adder for those uh, for for every bit uh, with uh, individually, which would make your code uh, more complicated. And uh, uh, in fact, if you have a single module that works for all cases, you just need that one module. You don't need that many modules. Reduce the the chances of having bugs. Okay. So if you need some more resource about very low coding. Uh, here's a good reference from Avain, who is a professor uh, from MIT. And we also have uh, tips for using Altera tools. And uh, it's, it has been tracking down since 2012. And, um, but it works fairly well uh, since then. So we didn't uh, revise it. So that's about uh, my brief overview on uh, like very long. If you don't, uh, if you don't have any question, I think we are uh, finishing the lecture. So questions? Okay, Alan. Oh yeah, can you say again how many times we meet per week? Well, it depends, and um, I would say like five to ten. Okay. Yep, per person. Okay. okay. Other than that, other questions? Okay, if not, I will see you uh, for CSE 141 lecture, uh, L lecture on Wednesday. Uh, all right, goodbye.